You either die a hero, or you live long enough to see yourself become the villain. This famous line from Christopher Nolan's film The Dark Knight hits us deep, because we've seen it play out time and time again throughout our human history. Many of the heroes we look up to ultimately fail us, turn to evil, or end up revealing they were never a hero at all. Samson is one of those characters. When I was a kid, Samson was one of my favorite biblical heroes. I wanted to be like him, because as a kid I was small and scrawny. I was picked on and easily beaten up because of my small size. But Samson had supernatural strength and could take on anyone. But as I grew up, I became disgusted with Samson. He murdered 30 men because he lost a bet, tortured animals as a way to enact revenge, slept with a prostitute, and was an idiot who was easily seduced by Delilah. He does so many horrible things, but through it all, God grants him supernatural strength and allows him to keep living as a prideful moron. It is only when his hair is cut, breaking his Nazarite oath, that God leaves him. Why would the Spirit of God not leave Samson after all the pain and misery he caused, and instead only leave because he was dumb enough to let his girlfriend know the secret to his strength and cut his hair while he slept? The story of Samson is in the Bible for a reason, and there is a lot we can learn from it. The point is that Samson was never the hero and never should be seen as one. Samson, from beginning to end, was a villain, and yet, God was still able to use him. It didn't matter that he was a villain. God, through his omniscience, knew what to do. Many people do not know the full story of Samson, but if you go through it, you'll be mortified by what you read. Samson was born at a time when the Philistines oppressed Israel. The angel of the Lord came to a man and his wife of the tribe of Dan and told them they would bear a son. He would begin to free Israel from the Philistines. She was not to drink any alcohol or eat anything unclean because this child would be a Nazarite from the womb. A Nazarite vow was typically something an Israelite could voluntarily take and only for a temporary period of time. They would abstain from alcohol and grapes, stay away from corpses, and refrain from cutting their hair. One could take the oath as an act of thanksgiving or for a special purpose. The point of the vow was to separate yourself for special service to God. It's likely that John the Baptist took a Nazarite vow and went into the wilderness to preach the coming of the gospel. Samson was unique and that he was not given a choice. God ordained it from before his conception as a sign that God would use him to begin to free Israel from the Philistines. But after this, things only go downhill. Samson grows up and decides he wants to marry a daughter of the Philistines. Judges 14 specifically says Samson wanted her because she was right in his eyes. The use of this phrase might echo how numerous times in the book of Judges it records Israel did what was right in their own eyes, implying they acted sinfully and rebelled against God. The allusion here might imply the authors are saying Samson was beginning to live in a sinful manner, instead of living in a way that was right in God's eyes. The scholar Robert Alter also notes the phrase may indicate that Samson never spoke to the woman. She was sexually attractive, and that was enough for Samson. This was an insult to Israel. The one who was supposed to free them from the Philistines is fraternizing with the oppressors. Not only that, but there is no indication his wife was to become an Israelite, since the wedding feast happens with the Philistines and her father retains control over her after the marriage. There is no indication, like it was with Ruth, that this woman left her Philistine identity and joined the people of Israel. However, while this is going on, something peculiar happens that the authors want us to know. Samson is in a vineyard and kills a lion. Then later, he sees there is honey in the corpse and eats of it. Modern readers may not be aware, but Samson has already violated his Nazarite vow. Nazarites are not supposed to go near corpses. But Samson ate honey from the corpse of a lion, thereby violating his vow. This is an important point that we will come back to later. At the wedding feast, Samson in his arrogance proposes a riddle to the Philistines, which he knows they cannot answer. So in order to not lose the bet, the Philistines threaten the wife of Samson, 
who is still living among them and not with the Israelites. If she does not get the answer, they will burn her and her family alive. But she is successful and gives the answer to the Philistines, which enrages Samson. He calls his wife a heifer and insinuates she was engaging in an affair with them. He then goes to Ashkelon, a Philistine city, kills 30 men, takes their armor so he can pay his gambling debt. All while the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Samson then returns to Israel, and the marriage is seen as annulled. So his wife is given to his best man. But Samson returns later in an attempt to sleep with his wife. Her father refuses because she was remarried, and in his anger, Samson sets loose several foxes with torches tied to their tails in the Philistines' grain fields. The Philistines respond by burning alive Samson's ex-wife and her father. They then demand Israel hand Samson over. Samson is tied up and handed over, but the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon him and he breaks free. Using the jawbone of a donkey, he kills his Philistine captors. However, this is the second time he has come in contact with a corpse, violating his vow. Then Samson goes to Gaza and sleeps with a prostitute. He escapes before the Philistines of Gaza can trap him, and then it is said he loved a woman named Delilah. However, it never says they were married. Like before, the Philistines go to Delilah, and this time they offer to pay her if she can figure out the secret of his power. For a while, Samson lies to her and tells her other ways to remove his power. But after she badgers him relentlessly, he finally caves in and tells her. While he sleeps, the Philistines cut his hair, and it is said the Lord left him at this point. Without God's help, Samson was taken by the Philistines and tortured. His eyes were gouged out, and he was thrown into a prison, but slowly his hair grew back. Then one day, during a festival, they brought Samson out to humiliate him. But Samson cried out to God for strength so that he could avenge his eyes. Pushing over two pillars that held the temple up, he caused the roof to collapse on everyone inside, thereby killing many Philistines, but also himself. Now this story puzzles a lot of people. How could God grant such power to a horrible man and then only abandon him when his hair was cut? Why not when he slept with a prostitute or abandoned his wife? An important lesson from this episode is simply that God will use whomever he chooses for a greater purpose, regardless of how they morally behave. Samson was never given power because he was a good person or a prophet or chased after God's own heart. His actions were never even directed or caused by God. Samson was only given power because of the divine providence of God and nothing else. God knew this prideful and arrogant man could be used to free the children of Israel from their oppressors. That is the only reason ever given as to why God granted him power. There was a greater purpose at play, and Samson was only a pawn. This is the lesson of Samson. God's goal has always been to save his people, and he is willing to use the last person we would expect to display his power. This is an important lesson we must learn, because today, we often place our faith in men or women who present the gospel, and not the one who gave us the gospel. The women and men that God uses are only tools to reach the world, and never hold up to the standard of goodness in Christ they represent. They always fall short, and sometimes they do not even have Christ living in them. They only present the good news without actually understanding it. People like Ravi Zacharias. Ravi was one of the biggest names in Christian ministry for years. He had one of the largest international ministries, spoke in front of thousands around the world. He was incredibly charismatic and was able to present the gospel in an intellectual way that was captivating and poetic. It was hard to hear the words of Ravi and not be moved. Thousands of people were, and many came to accept Christ solely because of him. And then he died, and we mourned, and then the truth came out. While he lived, traveled, and preached, Ravi abused dozens of women, taking advantage of them sexually. While he was preaching, in the shadows he was shattering the lives of many women. When reports started to come in about how he was abusing women, we didn't believe them. When Lori Ann Thompson stepped forward to report what Ravi was doing, she was attacked and insulted. 
the church failed to hear her, because many thought no one who preached like that could ever be engaging in the behavior that Ravi was being accused of. And we were wrong. Ravi may have started out a hero, but as his fame grew, he became blinded by pride and lust. He did not die a hero, even though he fooled us all. He lived long enough to become the villain. And now, what are the people who came to Christ because of the preaching of Ravi? What sort of testimony is that? That they were led to Christ by a man who sexually and spiritually abused women? Because of what Ravi has done, some have now walked away from Christ. Many people have been left wondering what happened and if any of it was real. The question we as the church have to ask is if our faith and gratitude was in Christ or in Ravi. If you cannot look past Ravi and see the cross as the reason you're saved, then your faith was never in Christ, but in the charisma of a spokesperson. In truth, Ravi didn't save anyone. He merely presented the truth. Christ saved you. Ravi was just a pawn for a greater purpose. I sometimes see testimonies from deconverted Christians. Often they speak of how horrible the Christians were that they grew up around, or how backwards their thinking was, or how oppressive they were, or how hypocritical they were. And so they left because of the behavior they observed in the church. These ex-Christians often say something like that they could no longer be part of a religion that preaches such hate. But if that is your reason as to why you left Christ, you were never really following him because he did not let you down. Other people did. Your faith was not in Jesus, but in a religious identity or a community that failed you. Christ lived the life you should have lived, died the death you should have died, and despite all of us being his enemies, he has extended grace and love to us. He has never failed you. Others failed you. And if you walked away from Christ because of what others did, your faith was never in Christ, but in something else. The church has failed multiple times, continues to fail in multiple ways, and will continue to fail to properly represent Christ. I will fail. I will fail to live up to being a good Christian, as I have multiple times in the past. But Christ will never fail you. The work he is doing may not make total sense in the here and now, but often when we are in the dead of night, we cannot see that the dawn is approaching. Often when he is leading us up the mountain, we can only feel the blisters and see the rocks in front of us, while not realizing with every step we are moving closer to the summit growing into a new person that is more Christ-like. Christ knows the best way to save all who can be, and he will even use those who have rejected him for a greater purpose. When Joseph was sold into slavery, his brothers meant it for evil. But later, after he was raised up in Egypt, he told his brothers, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. When Joseph was sold as a slave, God's power and wisdom were displayed because many were saved through that evil act. The Sanhedrin and the Romans meant to crucify the Lord for their own selfish desires. But Christ allowed it to happen and he used their actions so the Son of Man could rise again, conquering death and saving us all. As St. Paul said, We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. God in his omniscience knows how to respond to evil when it occurs, and how to use it for his glory, even if the villain never intended it for that purpose. Ravi was a horrible man who used his power to hurt many women. Now that we know this, he should never be celebrated. But there are still many people who he led to Christ, despite his double life. Those who walked away from Christ because of Ravi, left because their faith was never in Christ, but in the character and charisma of Ravi. But there are still many who have realized Ravi was just a tool that God used to bring them into the kingdom. Many were able to look past this man and see it was really Christ who was calling them. That is the real testimony we all have. We were called by the Lord himself, who worked through his servants and sometimes through those who don't even know him. 
The hero of the story in Judges was never Samson. It was God. God merely used Samson to save his people from the Philistines. Notice in the story, Samson violated his Nazarite vow before his hair was cut. In his battle with the Philistines, he used a jawbone from a corpse of a donkey, thereby violating it. Samson rejected God and lived for himself. God had no obligation to give him power, but God had a greater purpose in mind, and in his wisdom, he knew how to use Samson to free Israel from oppression. Even in the end, Samson didn't cry out to God for salvation or for forgiveness. He only asked for power to avenge his eyes. It was always about him. He never cared about God or God's goal of saving his people from oppression. He died a villain with only himself on his mind. But God still used him to free those who were oppressed. And so, whether it is Samson, Ravi, or any other sinner alongside us, remember that God has not blessed them with a gift because of something good or holy about them, but because he has a goal to save his people from sin and bring them into the kingdom. We may not see it now, but God's plan is unfolding before our eyes. He will use the wicked for a greater purpose, and in their sin, God's power and wisdom will eventually be revealed. If you were led to Christ by something Ravi said or wrote, remember who was really speaking to you. Ravi revealed himself to be a con artist, but God still used him and will continue to work to save his people despite our sin. There is only one hero in the whole story of mankind. All those who came before him failed and became villains themselves. Abraham treated his wife like property to be given to Pharaoh. Jacob favored one son, causing jealousy between his children. Moses doubted God and could not control his anger. David committed adultery and gave in to pride. Elijah ran away in depression. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Which is why God came himself to save us. Because none of us ever could. He became a man and lived the perfect life and took the penalty of our sin and failures upon himself. Christ became a man who was never the villain and yet died the death of a villain. He bore all the shame and guilt of our sin, carried it to the cross and buried it. Unlike us, Christ did something we could never do. He died a hero and came back to live as one forever.